Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you have ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. I am your host, Patty Porter. My guest hosts, Dina Zametta and Stephen Kotev, along with our guest experts, will share our experiences, raise your awareness, and give you food for thought. We will share with you problem-solving strategies, no matter what your situation is, at work, with neighbors or friends, family, and with partners. Tune in or join in the conversation every Tuesday evening. Hi, this is Zena Zumeta, and our program today is Resolving Financial Fights in Marriage and Divorce. Couples often have differences about finances in their marriages, and those differences become exacerbated in divorce. In this program, we will look at issues in divorce financial planning, the emotional components of financial decision-making, and how couples can resolve financial differences in both marriage and divorce. Joining me is Pam Friedman. Pam has over 20 years of financial planning and investment experience on Wall Street in both New York and London and in public and private companies. Uh, She's been on the faculty of the finance department in the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. Her particular area of expertise is marital financial planning, including planning for the risk of divorce and educating clients who may be unfamiliar with financial issues and investing during and after divorce. She's a certified financial divorce financial planner as well as a certified financial planner. She's also a trained family law mediator. She has an MBA, a BBA, and BA in finance and economics from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to the program, Pam. Thanks, Ina. It's great to be here. So it's wonderful to have you. And could I just start out by asking you, how did you get into the field of divorce financial advising? Well, I left Wall Street and then uh, teaching at the University of Texas, decided to fully launch into personal financial planning. And in the sort of retraining of all that, uh, as a certified uh, financial planner, we did a lot of things in estate planning, insurance, investments, college planning, taxes, all relating to two of what I consider the three risks uh, that we all may face, two of them being death and disability. Mm. Certainly insurance and estate planning are, are, are big into both those issues. But no one really talked about divorce, and divorce is what people started to show up in my office. And so I got a little more training from the people who certified you, certify you as a divorce financial analyst, uh, which is the Institute of Divorce Financial Analysts, and learned that, you know, I think the programs for financial analysts are missing a piece, of a real risk that exists in all of our lives. If you do get married, or even if you buy assets with a significant other, what's the exit plan? And uh, I think it's an important part of financial planning. You know, you are so right. And I, I think I hadn't actually thought about those things as risks. Um you, I mean, you're completely right. But when you look at it from that angle as a risk, it sort of changes the whole way of thinking and the way that I would want to plan. Yeah, I I, I think it is. Um, it's part and should be part of everyone's financial plan. You know, I, I, I'm thinking now because I do divorce mediations, and I'm thinking now about the way that people react when they realize they're going to have to split up their financial lives. I mean, they panic. And it's because yeah. it's so you're just so right. It's because they haven't planned for that eventuality. They plan for death. Right. Some plan for disability. Nobody plans for divorce. Exactly. You know, and, and the, one of the ways I help, you know, it's never too late. You can always do some planning even in the, during the process of divorce. I mean, what I do is I help people get organized. Some of the things they should have done maybe before they thought about divorce, you know, we gather and review all the financial documents, including everything from their tax returns to their bank and investment statements. We get those into a worksheet that both a client, a client's spouse, and their attorney can easily understand. And then we help create a budget 
for a new single life. And we look at gaps in that budget to assess their needs or surpluses that can be used in support dis uh, discussions. We also help to determine value. You know, I'm not a tax accountant, but I know how taxes impact, in impact investments and selling investments. Um, and there are other costs of dividing assets. So we, we put that all into our analysis of how things might work out. We also determine needs. Listen, every asset doesn't have to be split in half. Often the lower income or stay-at-home spouse needs more liquidity, meaning cash, to get their life back on track. While maybe a higher income spouse wants to avoid high income generating assets or low basis assets that would be expensive for them to sell. We do some financial projections. Very importantly, we provide support. Attorneys love this. Mediators love this. <laughs> We're the ones that come with the client that knows what they have and knows what they want. And very lastly, we continue to work with clients after the divorce. Um, divorce attorneys, they think you're, you got your settlement agreement, you're good to go. And really, you're, you've got a settlement agreement, but you're not settled yet. We work with them to uh, change accounts, get things moved before anyone can really mess with those things, drain accounts, for example. Uh, we don't want to see that happen. So we get people still motivated yeah. after the, the final decree. Well, that's great. Well, can I, can I sort of unpack what you just said, because you went through a lot in those. <laughs> yeah, three sentences. Right. we do a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, so where do you start with people? Um, when they come to us for for divorce, we really the, the gathering the documents is the most important thing. Um, you know, I of course I'm biased. I'm a divorce financial analyst. I want you to come see me first before you go see the attorney, mm. who may be more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you go to that attorney prepared, that the process on the legal side is much more efficient. You know what you have and what you want and what you need, all those things. Now, that, that said, you so know, the I recognize the that documents, – So the documents that you're talking about are, are what? Give, give us some examples. So certainly a tax return. You can tell a lot from a tax return. Anything that generated income during the year is an asset. But there are assets mm -hmm. that someone may have that don't generate – income during the year. So that may not tell the whole story, but something like, are there deposits with the IRS? We can see that on a tax return. Are there valuable um, capital losses that are being carried forward? Um, other things that we can identify that may be of value to the marital estate. So you're really just looking for documents about assets, right? Right, and, debt, and then we do the budget. Yeah. Separately, we'll work on a budget, and that budget will reveal gaps. From one side, it might re reveal a surplus, that there's excess funds, and one side might reveal that there's a, a gap and a need, and that starts the negotiation for a support payment. Got it. Got it. So, so those two things, looking at the assets and debts and then also looking at budgets, are really the preparatory work that you do for people as they're heading into a divorce. And then w when you say they're prepared when, when they get to the lawyer, to the mediator, um, do you actually do a financial plan? What, what, what do they come out of their meeting with? Well, we prepare a worksheet that both the attorney and uh, the other spouse can understand easily. We simplify things. Um, we may start a process of putting things on one side or the other. Uh, we don't negotiate. Mm -hmm. We let the attorney do that or let the couple do that, depending on whether they're going to mediation or some sort of court process. But we might mm -hmm. encourage a client uh, or recommend to a client they mean, need more liquidity or they might want assets that have a lower uh, or higher tax basis, be less responsible for taxes. So uh, different assets fit different people's needs going forward. Um, when I say liquidity, so you're I mean really, cash. you're really, yeah, cash. I like that. You're, <laughs> so you're really recommending to the person who comes to you. This is what I think would be best for your financial future. These are the types of assets that would be best for you to go after. Is that? Am I getting that correctly? Yeah, uh, but we can't promise anybody anything. There's two sides to every negotiation, right. as you well know. <laughs> uh, right. but we do, so we try right. not to get people too anchored on any one thing. Um, and there's lots of different ways to make decisions about what you want. The economic decision is really where I'm involved. 
what's what's necessary right. for you to move forward in your life. But there are other reasons to make decisions that I may not fully know about and get revealed during the process of working with a client. There are emotional reasons to make a decision. Um, let's face it, if we didn't have the emotional part of our brain, we couldn't make any decisions. That's required and been shown. Um, and then there's sort of emotions cousin, uh, which is convenience. What's the fastest path? You know, really, how can we just get this done uh, the quickest way possible? So, uh, which is sort of an emotional decision, but maybe a subcategory. So, what I try to do is get my clients to weigh the factors that I bring up, the economic factors, against maybe some emotional factors they have and some convenience factors they have. Weigh them all appropriately. I'm helping the client do that, but it's always up to the client what they want to do. And I, as I uh, think about it, You've really described a lot of the thinking that my clients certainly in divorce mediation go through in terms of what would I ideally like, but then in terms of the emotional part of it. I love the way you described it because part of it is what am I attached to? Part of it is how badly do I want to get out of this relationship? So all of those things are, are swirling around at, at the same time. Right. The, the tough part is there's usually two sides to every emotional story. Um, and you may get one party who's well prepared to attend a mediation or even a court process has thought it through. Often, that's the woman. The woman tends to, the wife tends to overanalyze, be thinking about it ahead of time, try to get some professional help. Um, stereotypically, a man might want to just get things done and make a decision and deal with the consequences later. Oh, interesting. Well, let me remind everyone that you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach radio blog talk radio program, um, and I am speaking with Pam Friedman about resolving financial disputes in marriage and divorce. Well, should we move over to people who are actually still married? Um, how yeah. can we talk about money to avoid divorce? <laughs> Well, I mean, treat it like any other risk. Like we talked about, there's a lot of discussion in the financial planning world about, you know, planning if you're going to die. So there's life insurance discussions, how much life insurance you should have, what your estate plan should look like to avoid taxes, um, disability, the same kind of thing. Um, how do you insure against that? What are the likelihoods? In fact, you're more likely to become d disabled before the age of 65 than you are um, to die. So these are important topics and have always been covered by the financial planning world, but the risk of divorce hasn't. So um, I really want to see more people in my office who are married and hopefully happily married know the rules of the road. And by that, I mean get some financial education together and get some knowledge about how your rights are protected in divorce in your state. Um, and my suggestion is that couples write their own rules instead of depending on what the law says, because the law is there. It's written by lawyers. They like to argue, and they like to make money doing it. So it's not clear, uh, and it may not apply to you. It may not apply to your family's financial life. Um, a common gap in a lot of uh, couples' lives or knowledge base on the legal side is the difference between separate and marital property. Uh, anything you own before marriage or received by inheritance is separate property. Everything you earn, your income, uh, during the marriage or acquire during the marriage belongs to the marital estate. Now, that's the general rule. Every state has a twist on that rule. And, you know, really that's what keeps everyone arguing divorce. So, you know, write your own rules. Do a prenuptial agreement, a postnuptial agreement. Um, I have had clients in the past who uh, came in, they were curious about divorce, and what it turned out is they just needed a post-nuptial agreement. They needed to determine what was separate and what was marital in order to feel comfortable with it moving forward in their financial lives and their lives in general. And so instead of getting divorced, so they did a post-nuptial agreement. Oh, how wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting that I, I now that you're saying that, I remember a couple that uh, I saw who came in because uh, and, and thinking about divorce. And the wife actually said, the only way that, that I can find out what my husband actually owns is to file for divorce. Because then I have a right to know. But as wife, I don't have a right to know. And so... 
they filed for divorce, and then when she found out what she needed to find out, she withdrew <laughs> the filing. <laughs> so it's it's so it's so interesting that you say that because I I, th- I think that it's it's too bad you have to get to divorce um, to to really think that through. And and you're saying okay maybe a post nuptial agreement. Do you ever bring up that question of divorce, or do you wait for a couple to bring it up to discuss what if you divorce? Yeah, no, I do. Um, most of the folks who seek me out, I'm, I'm, I'm doing financial planning. They, they know my background. They've read my resume, so they have some idea that that's going on. But I think it's very hard. It's a hard subject for a husband and wife or a couple to talk about. How do you get started in a conversation? Yeah. The client you just mentioned, uh, the person you were working with, what if she could have approached her husband and said, hey, I really want to have a money conversation? You know, how do you start that conversation? It's really hard to start. So I've suggested to people that maybe they start talking about their parents. Talk about somebody else first. How did your parents Interesting. Yeah. And did they put you through college? Did you get an allowance? All those kinds of – and ease into the conversation about how you handle money. And see what the reaction is. And maybe, you know, in her case that she wasn't getting any reaction. But hopefully you get a more positive reaction than that. And you can ease into, hey, let's sit down and make a list, make a list of all of our assets and all of our debts, and let's make uh, a budget. Let's start a budget. It doesn't have to be exactly, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Do the best you can. And, of course, if you need a little help or need a little help talking about that, seek out a financial planner or specifically a divorce financial planner who's seen the other side and can help you all talk. Yeah, so so sitting down, I, I'm intrigued by the idea of starting with somebody else instead of starting with us to start talking about somebody else because that that would be much easier to talk about. Mm-hmm. And, and Absolutely. still, the the idea of planning for divorce it, it it leaves me kind of shaking. Even as somebody who's a divorce mediator, I'm thinking, could I bring up what if we divorce if I'm not actually thinking about it? Yeah, well, we, yeah, the University of Texas McCombs Business School, the family is the economic unit. Uh, We have a a statue on campus. And that's really true. When you get married, you've created an economic, you've created a company that's moving together forward. And if you're transparent and open about those issues, maybe you avoid divorce. I don't know. Right. I, I, I hope that's the case. And, uh, and and you're at least more informed about what the exit plan is. If there there needs to be an exit plan, sometimes having an exit plan means you don't exit. You would you would never start a business without an exit plan. You should never really go into a marriage without at least considering what might happen. Now this is especially true in the case where someone's going to be a, a stay at home parent, uh, because that person is really the most vulnerable. There is a divorce gap. Yeah, almost every state. There's this impression when you get divorced that the wife is taking the husband to the cleaners, and nothing could be further from the truth. Often the spouse who is the lower earner really does suffer economically beyond the divorce while the other spouse continues to rise in their career and make more money. Have you actually seen statistics on that? I haven't seen statistics on it. I know that from experience because we're doing projections for those families, and we can see where it's headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. It certainly, yeah. you know, jibes with what I've with I've seen. Um, and yet, I think a stay at home parent, because there are men who do it now, um, is is the one who is feeling like they don't have any negotiating power. Right, and and they they feel because, like they're asking their spouse for something during divorce. I'm sure you've experienced that. I don't think my spouse right. will give me that. I don't think I'll be able to get that from my spouse. I don't think my spouse will give that up. But these are things that were earned by you together as the economic unit, the family the family economic unit, and you have to consider that. I'll tell you, it's even more important in, uh, in older marriages these days. Anyone over 50, uh, a lot of folks had kids later in life. They get to their 50s. Statistics, you're twice as likely – as a 50-year-old, to get divorced now than you were 20 years ago. And that group of people has very little time to recover economically from a divorce. 
you just don't have that really time true. frame in front of retirement. So I, I didn't mean to turn the subject there, but that is an important part of what we're talking about. It's not just the stay-at-home parent, but it's also older couples. So you're talking in about fact, the two most vulnerable types of mm-hmm. people, um, the stay-at-home parent and the older divorce person. I think I saw a statistic 25% of all divorces are now people over 50. Wow. Wow. And I, I, I wonder, does that mean that, that they re- – I'm, I'm sure their standard of living has to go down after divorce. It does. Especially um, at that age. We're, we're looking at sometimes somewhere between 30 and 40% more cost. Because uh, so, remember, you're sharing so many expenses. You've got two households now. And whether you're young and you're not working and you're stepping into that or you're older and don't have enough time to make up for that additional cost – it really can be meaningful, a meaningful risk to your financial future. Right, right. Um, and by the so way, I was going to bring – go ahead. Oh, by the way, I was going to bring up, you don't, have to, you don't have to be married to be in these situations. Um, there are many people well, who are living together in their 50s. Good point. <laughs> uh, good there point. are non-traditional marriages. Um, those people need to do the same kind of planning uh, because you're sharing right. assets, you're sharing expenses. Uh, you may be co-owning a home. Um, so those those need to be looked at as well. It's not just marriage. Right. So if, if I walked in <clears throat> to your office and I said, you know, whether I'm living with somebody or I'm married – and um, I'm feeling pretty vulnerable, and I'm thinking about either thinking about divorce or worrying about whether my partner or my spouse is thinking about exiting. Um, <laughs> do you do you suggest first that people sit down together and talk, or do you go right into let me help you plan? Well, in my experience, uh, I occasionally work with couples who come to me together and they say, you know, we think we know how to work this out. We just want someone to work with us on the financial planning going forward. And it does work, and and those are really the best case scenarios. But um, unfortunately, it's not the common scenario that I see. Often it's one spouse who comes in and wants to do some planning and just thinking ahead about what their divorce will look like. Um, I, I, it's just very difficult, I think, for couples to, to work together. And that's where the role of mediation comes in. You know, ideally, um, even if just one person has a little bit more information, a little more knowledge, even that can make a mediation go more smoothly. You can't determine what the other side oh, is going to do, but it does, does have more information is better. Absolutely. And if someone like you is working with the spouse that has, there's often in in a couple, a spouse that has uh, less knowledge about finances and a spouse that has more knowledge about finances. So if someone like you is working with the spouse that has less knowledge, that really makes a a huge difference in the ability of both people to negotiate. Right. It it, it can really help. Yeah. And then do you ever go to the negotiations or go to mediation? I do. Um, I'll often attend mediation with my client to help them assess the changes that go back and forth and what that means for their projections going forward, their financial life going forward. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that as, as a mediator, I'll often ask somebody like you to be a neutral financial expert and, and help in the mediation with exactly what you're talking about, but just for both people. Yeah, that can be a tremendous benefit to a lot of mediations, and it's surprising that it hasn't happened more often. It is happening more often that a, a financial professional will come in as a neutral and give a pro and a con. Even when I'm working with one side, I try to give my clients that here's the advantage to you, here's the advantage to your spouse, and keep it uh, because you eventually you do have to negotiate. So you may as well yes. know what the, the pro and the con to each side are, so even when I'm working on one side. That, that's really helpful. Well, um, I know that you have a book. Do you want to talk a little bit about your book? Sure. Uh, I released a book last December. I now pronounce you financially fit. Uh, the book I love goes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, it's How to Protect Your Money in Marriage and Divorce is the subtitle. And the book starts with how to talk to your spouse about money, how to gather the assets, um, how to make a list, and I have very helpful worksheets on my website. I now pronounce you financiallyfit.com, uh, which you can go grab mm-hmm. for free. If you're interested in some of those worksheets to get started a conversation with your spouse, there's also a budgeting worksheet on there with very specific categories to try to get you to start writing a budget. It's, you know, perfect again is the enemy of good. Try to get it started and uh, and show it to your spouse, maybe over a glass of wine. Uh, but that sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that, that glass of wine is a great way to do it. That's great. So, one, so really you're – so you have your book and you have your website <laughs> and right. um pe- people can actually get all of the information but also advice on how to approach a lot of the topics that we've been talking about. Right, but I would be remiss to to not say the following, which is if there's any kind of abuse of drugs or alcohol or if there's been physical or mental abuse in a relationship, that's when you need to see an attorney first. And I say this in the book very seriously. It's a, it's a serious topic. Um, often people are so weighed down. Um, uh, something like 60% of people say that stress, money and stress, uh, money is their number one stressor, rather. Um, and so they come to see me, but they, other things are revealed during the meeting, and we immediately get them into an attorney. Um, a a certified divorce financial analyst and many financial planners, certified financial planners, will know attorneys. So if that happens, we get them to an attorney very quickly. Um, That's wonderful. Other professionals that that are helpful um, sort of brings up the subject. You know, other professionals that are very helpful in the process uh, are parenting coordinators. So if your issue is money, uh, and there are no, no abuse issues, you're not seeing an attorney right away, if your issue is money, see a divorce financial analyst. If you're if you're concerned about the kids, you may have a parallel track to see a parenting coordinator. Um, having the, both those people involved and helping you prepare before you see attorney can really make the the meeting with the attorney much more efficient. Um, married or not, if you co-own a house and you're thinking about getting out of that relationship, seeing a certified divorce lending professional may help or a mortgage broker to talk to, they're also very helpful. And everyone should think about seeing a licensed marriage and family therapist for, to deal with the emotional issues. I love your advice. I think it's really, really wise. And, and also your caveats about um, in this situation, see this professional, or in that situation, right. see that professional. I think that, that's really helpful. So uh, where should people start? What If people are really interested in this, what's the first thing they should do? Well, depending on where you are, um, if you're looking for a financial professional who's experienced with divorce, um, many of whom are also certified uh, financial planners, you can go to the Institute of Divorce Financial Analysts. The website is institutedfa.com to find a planner in your area. Um, if you're in Austin, you can look at my website, which is um, I now pronounce you financiallyfit.com or uh, divorceplanningofaustin.com to find me and to work with me directly. Um, I think those are two good places to start. Um, searching on the web for parenting coordinators or um, licensed marriage, family, marriage and family therapists. Also, uh, everyone's on the web these days. You can find almost anyone. That's great. And for those of you who couldn't write fast enough to write all that down, don't forget that this program is archived and you could go back and listen and go over these pieces. But also, um, if you go onto that website, I now pronounce you financiallyfit.com, I bet there's a place that they can get in touch with you to ask questions if they have questions. Is that correct? Absolutely. All my contact information Good. is there. Oh, that's uh, really wonderful. Well, Pam, this, um, did you have one, something to add? Before. Well, I just um, I just want to add that, you know, try to encourage people to get started. Start that conversation with your spouse or your significant other. Uh, oh, that's great. And I, I just can't thank you enough uh, for coming on with, with all the information that you have, all the words of wisdom that you have, and the resources uh, that you have brought to this conversation. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. 
Uh-huh. Boar's Head invites you to enlighten your senses. Inter- Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you enjoyed the program. You can find all of our podcasts archived to listen at your convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. You can also become a Facebook fan of Conflict Connections or Twitter me at TX Conflict Coach.